session, session two, new opportunities and old challenges in manufacturing, agriculture, services, and trade. So uh, people are looking for some discussion on the classic uh, basic sectors, like what's happening to industry, what's happening to agriculture. This is the session. So now that we've settled down, we have a main speaker uh, presenting on this topic and three discussants, as you can see in your program. First, our main speaker. Our main speaker we are privileged to have is Dr. Uh, Albert Park, the, the chief economist at the Asian Development Bank, and he's also director general of its economic research and development impact department. So he has more than two decades of experience as a development economist and is a well-known expert on the economy of the People's Republic of China, working on a broad range of development issues, poverty and inequality, intergenerational mobility, microfinance, etc. So many. Um, uh, Dr. Park is Chair, Professor of Economics, Social Science, and Public Policy at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So uh, without further ado, let's listen uh, to the presentation of Dr. Park. Hi, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I was asked to talk about new opportunities and old challenges in manufacturing, agriculture, and services and trade. And I'm going to really mainly focus in on manufacturing and services and not to say too much about agriculture, but I'm happy to talk about We have an agriculture expert right here who can talk about it. Uh, okay, so uh, next slide. So um, I want to talk about uh, what's new if we think about structural change in the role of industry and services. Um, there have been recent debates about this idea of deindustrialization, which is um, the notion that countries really don't have the same opportunities to industrialize like they used to, and that we see the country's employment shares in manufacturing actually peaking much earlier in the development process than uh, when the experience of earlier countries. And this, of course, is really important to think about Look, if we're in Asia, where there's been a long, very good track record of export led and manufacturing led industrialization that has really driven uh, growth. Um, so I want to talk about how to think about these debates about the industrialization. Uh, and then I want to talk about the role of globalization um, in thinking about these opportunities in industry and service sector development. Um, and then I want to turn to issues which I think were probably discussed uh, somewhat in the earlier morning session about escaping the Millington Pact, et cetera, about, thinking about uh, innovation and competition and then the role of industrial trade policies. And as we know, we're now suddenly in a world of protectionism, industrial policy, you know, a world that most economists, I think, would view somewhat skeptically and has less efficient outcomes than you know, would be optimal. Um, especially in uh, Asia, where the region really has benefited so much from open multilateral trade investment. Okay, so next slide. So uh, why do we think manufacturing may be important for development? So this slide kind of captures an older conventional wisdom, you know, that uh, manufacturing has certain properties which really help it to drive better development outcomes and faster growth. Uh, so it is really the type of production that uh, pushes technological change. Um, it enhances incentives for workers to acquire skills to be productive in this sector. Um, it has properties of economy of scale, which can increase efficiency. Obviously, it's a traded good, so uh, it can connect economies to the global market. And I think the more we understand about economics or economic development, the more we appreciate that being part of the global economy actually is a really important, um, almost prerequisite to transfer technologies that will drive growth, either through trade or foreign direct investment. Um, and it has good demand properties that uh, many, many manufacturers Goods have high income elasticity, so as countries develop, the demand increases and supports uh, expansion of industries. Okay, next slide. So this slide is taken from 
uh, an ADB report that tried to review the kind of development history of Asia uh, that was done a, a couple of years ago. And if you look at manufacturing employment shares, uh, you know, you can kind of here see the history of successful development in the region. So the NIEs, which are the newly industrializing economies, Korea, Taipei, China, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, these saw very, you know, pretty significantly high percentages of employment in manufacturing. China, you see, has also um, had a steadily increasing share of employment in manufacturing, whereas uh, ASEAN and India, also we see some increase, but still not at the same levels as the earlier um, successful economies. You can see on the right-hand side, there is this positive correlation between the growth in exports of goods, and this is the x-axis, and the GDP growth rates, which is the y-axis. So there seems to be a positive association in kind of the history of East Asia between export um, uh, growth and economic growth. Next slide, please. Okay. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is that um, there was a, a very nice report done over 20 years ago by David Dollar and Paul Collier at the World Bank where they uh, were looking at this question about growth uh, globalization, growth, and poverty. And they described three historic periods of pretty rapid increased globalization. Um, and the first period was in the late 19th century to the early 20th century, 1870 to 1914, uh, before the Great Depression. And the second period was the post-war, World War II period, 1945 to 1980. And the last period is the period after 1980. And one thing that's really remarkable, and it's really pretty well documented in, in, the, in one of the chapters in this uh, short, thin book, is that these periods of rapid globalization were characterized by faster growth and convergence among economies that were participating in the globalization during those periods. Uh, and in the first two periods, there were, and even the third period, there are still plenty of economies that were not really participating in this globalization for a variety of reasons. But the ones that were, and in the first two periods, it was mostly advanced economies in different parts of the world, globalizing together and growing faster and uh, becoming more similar in their levels of development but kind of leaving the developing world behind. It was only in this last period of globalization, which is kind of portrayed here, where developing countries were really able to penetrate global markets as manufacturers. Before that, in the earlier periods, there were still uh, developing countries were mostly exporting commodities. And there were still tariff regimes that prevented them from really exporting a lot of manufacturers. And you can see here, the share of developing country exports that were manufactured goods really shut up in this post-1980 period. Okay, so that's a really a unique feature of economic history that has really contributed to the whole rise of kind of the South in any in economic terms. And the emerging markets now we see are, are accounting for you know a huge part of GDP and still most of the global growth. Okay. Next, please. But the nature of industry is changing, and the nature of manufacturing is changing. And mainly, uh, I think there are two reasons why people have become a little bit more pessimistic that today's developing countries can really achieve the same kind of growth through export-led manufacturing production. The first is technology has changed. And that's probably the major reason. The second that some people mention, and I've had conversations with very senior people in the Philippines who also cite this reason, is the China price, right? That for a long period, while China has been dominating uh, manufacturing uh, 
growth and has become the factory of the world, it has somehow become harder for other countries to compete. Um, but, you know, coming back to the technology part, um, you know, some people have labeled these different stages of technological progress, industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0, right? And here in the uh, 3.0, this is technology we're now pretty used to, computers, the internet, but this 4.0 is the one we're in the midst of, right? Um, and we may even, with AI now, be entering a, even a new uh, stage, right? But 4.0 has been around for a little while in terms of the automation of industrial production with uh, robotization, and then we also have 3D printer, printing, Internet of Things, um, and uh, especially the automation part with robots. This obviously means that unlike before, where manufacturing growth was very labor intensive, now it's becoming increasingly capital intensive, and so that provides less opportunity, number one, for labor abundant economies to really enjoy comparative advantage, um, but also the ability of manufacturing to absorb surplus labor kind of from the countryside is much more limited, so it can't drive growth uh, in an economy-wide economy -wide way at the same as uh, before. I was at an event recently in Shanghai where someone said he had just gone visited one of China's electric vehicle factories, and he, it was a, um, a Korean uh, former trade official, and he said he was amazed because he could see very few people on the assembly line in this EV factory. And China is one country that is really pushing this automation. Okay, next slide. Um, just to give a little bit more granularity to how to think about uh, how different exports of different types of goods can really help economic development. This picture on the, on the x-axis is plotting, this is a kind of a complicated figure. It comes from this very nice report by um, Mary Howard Kummer and uh, Nair, who uh, were talking about uh, the new manufacturing. Um, and the, the, the x-axis is export value to output ratio, and the y-axis is the kind of the blue-collar share of employment, so unskilled labor intensity, right? And then um, the size of these, uh, big, uh, these circles is the subsector's total share of manufacturing employment, um, and then the colors represent kind of how much how intensive they are in terms of R&D, which is kind of how dynamic they are in a technological sense, right? And what you can see is um, different, these kind of sectors are grouped into five main categories. We have these commodity-based regional processing type activities. It's like simple, for instance, processing of ag agricultural goods or other things, other, other commodities. And that tends to have modest exports, um, but be very uh, unskilled. It helps employ unskilled workers. Then uh, you get to the capital intensive uh, processing, which obviously is not going to demand as many unskilled workers, but has more export potential. And then um, the big exporting goods are the ones to the right here. You have the textiles, this type of sector, which are um, uh, very uh, unskilled labor intensive, have some ability to innovate, but it's these blue uh, circled sectors, the medium skilled global innovators. We're talking about electronics, which has been a huge driver of innovation and progress in a lot of East Asia, and still is really, Japan, Korea, China to some extent. And then you have the more um, uh, high skill global innovations, which now, you know, get. And you could probably add like new energy kind of EVs and stuff into this category because they're very innovative and they're very R&D intensive. They're being exported a lot, but they don't really absorb the unskilled workers. They're very skill intensive. And uh, just a preview, 
what's happening in the service sector today, uh, as service sectors have become more tradable, they're also looking like this. They're, they tend to be more exportable, but they're very skilled. So they're not really working the less skilled workers in the economy. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let me switch over and talk about the service sector. And the most, we, we know that during the pandemic, digitalization really accelerated tremendously. And if you look at global trade statistics, it's really services trade, which is growing faster than goods trade. And within services, it's increasingly being dominated by digital services, which is the most dynamic part of the global economy. It includes BPO, business process outsourcing activity in the Philippines, as an example but a bunch of other stuff that's now going to be done, including e-commerce and other things. And you can see that Asia's share of their global trade in digital services has actually increased, and it's the only region that's increased relative to other regions. So it's, it's very dynamic in this part of the world uh, as well. Okay, next slide. And also, if you look at where FDI is going, the light blue bars are the FDI in the services sector. The red is manufacturing. And so you can see that the service sector, of course, is the largest sector of most economies, um, but it's also accounting for a lot of FDI. And increasingly, a lot of the strategic kind of investment is in, in digital services activity. Okay, next. All right, and so, uh, this just repeats kind of this growth in uh, services broken down by subregion. Asia is this light green shaded area, so it's increasing, but still behind the EU, which is the light blue area. Um, on the right, it breaks it down by subsectors, and this is all services exports, but a number of these are really mainly digital services. So, for example, the, the highest lines, the ones that are the account for the most trade in our growing pretty fast. One is this other business services, which includes the business process outsourcing, which is growing fast, especially in the Philippines and India. And then another important one is telecom, uh, and, and uh, that's the black line. And also the uh, travel, which took a big dip during the pandemic and is uh, recovering. Um, and the light blue is transport which is uh, usually associated with goods trade because it's servicing the transportation of uh, goods. Okay, next slide. Now, when we talk about the services sector, we have to uh, really uh, distinguish what types of services we're talking about because much more than manufacturing, there's huge differences among different service sectors, right? So you have like working in a restaurant or a hotel, but versus, you know, the kind of modern professional services that are now conducted online. And so if we divide these broadly between modern service sectors and traditional service sectors, then you can see that there's a huge difference in productivity of the modern sectors relative to the good sectors. And uh, nicely, this even has some bars for the Philippines, which shows Philippines uh, fits, you know, the same pattern as these other emerging markets. Next slide. Um, what's unfortunate, of course, is that these modern sectors, which are much more productive, also account still for a very low percentage of employment and services in the emerging markets, whereas in the United States, most of the service sector is in these professional service, modern services, uh, about 80%. So obviously, one, what you might think, obviously, oh, well, we just need to grow this modern service sector and we can raise productivity and have faster growth, perhaps, but easier said than done, right? Uh, next slide. Uh, so, you know, Danny Roderick at Harvard has been kind of one of the um, intellectuals who has been most outspoken about this deindustrialization, early deindustrialization pattern, pattern we're starting to see. So in one of his papers, 
um, published a little while ago in 2016, he, uh, he puts up kind of a simulated manufacturing employment share fitted to data of countries industrializing before 1990 and after 1990. And the main argument here is that because of the nature of technology and manufacturing uh, and services um, and the competitiveness of these markets that you are seeing the, in the red figure post-1990 that manufacturing share employment does peak at an earlier stage of development and at a lower level of employment than uh, for countries who had industrialized before 1990. Um, next slide. And here you can see an interesting figure which plots the income level at which manufacturing employment share peaks and uh, the employment share itself, okay? So in other words, if you're, you can see this downward slipping line, um, if you're at a lower income level when your employment share peaks, then the peak is going to be at a lower level in terms of the share of your workers who are in manufacturing. That seems logical. But if you look at the years of these countries in terms of when they reach their peak, you can see that the early industrialized are much more concentrated to the right hand side here where they were peaking at higher levels of income and reaching higher manufacturing shares than the later industrialized. So it fits the same pattern that he suggested in the previous figure. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is uh, based on, we, we at ADB, we have a research project that's looking at structural change and also uh, looking closely at these development patterns in Asia Pacific. Um, so one figure that they produce is this one, which is a very simple plot of GDP per capita on the x-axis and the employment share in industry. And you can see that if you just look at um, the red line, which is the predicted line for Asia, and the blue line, which is the predicted line for all countries in the world, I think it's 150 countries, economies. Number one, you see that the blue line and the red line look pretty similar. But the other thing you see is that the pattern in these lines are still such that at early stages of development, there still is a pretty strong association between increased industrial employment and increased GDP per capita. So that um, it's still the case that in Asia, developing uh, your industry seems to be associated with um, faster growth or higher GDP per capita levels. At the same time, if you look at the scatter point of the dots and ignore the lines, Asia are the red dots, the yellow dots are the world, and you can see that around this trend, there's just a huge amount of variation in the red dots. So even though there is a general pattern, there are many, many exceptions to the pattern where countries are getting to higher levels of development with lower manufacturing shares or higher manufacturing shares. So it's a fairly noisy predictor. It's not a very strong regularity where all the dots are right on these lines, right? Okay, next slide. Um, so if we think about, um, what, one thing I try to resist is framing this as like a choice of development strategy. Like, oh, we have to support manufacturing. And someone else saying, no, 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 we don't need to. We should just focus on services and we can become a rich country. I think in some ways that's a, a kind of a oversimplification and maybe even a false choice, right? And one reason is that uh, these two aspects of the economy are increasingly interlinked. They often support each other, right? So um, conceptually, this is back to this Hallward uh, uh, Dreymeyer report. Um, if you look at this uh, typical smile curve, which plots kind of um, level of sophistication uh, on the x-axis and then 
the share of a product's local value added on the y-axis. Uh, she argues in this uh, paper that the curve is changing from this yellow line to the blue line. And that means um, in the blue line that um, there is uh, more of the um, value added and manufacturing is coming from services at more sophisticated and at less sophisticated types of um, activities. And then um, this is also a pretty interesting uh, figure on the right, where she shows for some of the uh, leading emerging markets that the percentage contribution of the growth in service value added, um, she breaks it down into how services inputs to manufacturing and then how manufacturing inputs to services and you can see that um, both are significant for many of these economies, which means that to produce manufacturing, you need services, and to produce services, you need manufacturing. Maybe go to the next slide. And this is another way of representing it from work we've done at ADP, where we look at the domestic and foreign, the services basically component of gross exports uh, using more recent data, again, for a number of different countries. And so the way to read this is, for instance, the United States, whether it's 2010 or 2020, about 60% or so of exports are based on service in inputs, right? So most of the inputs into the export goods are coming from uh, services, but of course, the U.S. is exporting a lot of services as well, right? Um, if you look down at um, India, Brazil, Korea, China, Indonesia, emerging markets, then you can still see that these shares are quite high. Uh, many cases, 50% or slightly below 50%. And then among the service inputs going into manufacturing, or I'm sorry, going into gross exports, uh, most of it's domestic, but there's also, um, in many cases, a lot of foreign uh, companies who are producing the services that are going into the inputs that are then uh, into exported goods, right? So in ASEAN in particular, it looks a little bit higher in terms of the foreign share of the service inputs going into the export manufacturer. Okay, and then on the right, you see that there's a generally a positive association between TFP growth and the growth in um, ICT. So digital services is positive associated with growth, but not causal by any means. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these slides. The main point is that the kind of successful industrializers, China and Korea, you do see the uh, manufacturing plant staying at pretty high levels, but not as much as services, and you see faster growth and a bigger share of manufacturing compared to some of the other economies. If you go to the next in India and Southeast Asia. Yeah, so here we have Philippines, India, Indonesia, and they're not nearly as developed in terms of GDP per capita, and the share of services is it's much less. Um, okay, next slide. Um, in terms of globalization, even though we're in a world where all the narratives are about deglobalization and growing trade friction, actually production is still much more globalized than it has ever been historically. I mean, it's kind of plateauing and going down by some measures. In the region, it's high. And even in this figure, you can see that the global value chain participation rates in 2015 for most countries are higher than they were 20 years ago. Uh, some are on, above this line, including the Philippines, which suggests they're not really becoming more involved in global value chains. Um, next slide. Uh, and I, I want to highlight the importance of this global integration. Uh, again, going back to the previous slide where I showed that historically, globalization and is really what drives technology transfer and historically is when incomes rise faster and where conversions occur. So poor countries who are part of the global process benefit even more 
than richer countries. And so despite all these narratives we hear, I think countries in developing Asia really need to stay very committed to open trade and investment. It's still the best ticket, even in a constrained environment. And one thing, which I'll show you in a second, is that's gratifying is that governments in the region have generally been pretty good at maintaining this pragmatic commitment to open trade. And we don't see a huge rise in protectionism in Asia in response to all the crazy things happening in the rest of the world. Okay, so I wanted to say some things about innovation. Um, I'm gonna make it very short uh, because of time and also maybe you've heard some of this in the discussion of escaping the middle income trap. But one thing you see is that there are really differences in uh, whether countries are really investing in innovation or not. China, the NIEs really see these sharp upward trajectories, but the rest of development Asia has really struggled to invest in research and development. Next slide. And if you look at a global distribution of R&D percent of expenditures as a share, you know, uh, with as countries develop GDP on the x-axis, you see that there are a lot of Asian economies who are below this curve, meaning that they really are underinvesting in R&D. Next slide. Um, and this is the middle income trap figure from the World Bank report. Um, so I won't go over it again. Next slide. Um, so there was a pretty uh, interesting report in 2017 by the World Bank called the Innovation Paradox. And they, they pose this question, why are all these countries, including many in Asia, under-investing in R&D? Because we all think that's how you get growth. That's how you innovate. Why aren't you investing more? And the main point of the book is that the answer to this paradox is because that if you go to many firms who might be ones that would make an R&D investment decision, they're facing other constraints that reduce the return to that innovation investment, right? So for you to really get in you need to have a whole national innovation system that addresses a lot of the other constraints that prevent innovative investments from having a high return. And that includes many things from finance to intellectual property rights protection to ease of doing business to having the right skills in the economy. These are issues which go way beyond just narrow policies about innovation. They're really economy-wide institutions and environmental factors. And so that's what they argued is the reason why you see these patterns of underinvestment in many developing countries. Next slide. Okay, uh, let, next slide, I'm gonna skip this one. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, if you look at analysis of misallocation within economies, you see that poor countries often are misallocating resources. There's more distortions affecting the efficiency of resource allocation than in richer countries. And this also reduces the return to innovation and innovative investments. Next slide. Um, what is really important for innovation is competition as well, right? So this is a very famous paper by Agion um, where they have this inverse U curve, but most, most countries are on the left-hand side where more competition promotes more innovation. Next slide. And so I've done a lot of work in my career on the Chinese economy. And even though we read about China's industrial policies are really supporting their development, if you look at the data and if you look at the history of Chinese economic development, that is not the reason why China has done well. It is not industrial policy. It is actually competition. The periods in the 80s and 90s when China had a very competitive system is where you had really rapid growth, rapid growth of the non-state firms, which, which absorbed millions of laborers from the countryside. There was recent data analysis of Chinese firm level data, which show that in the most recent period, if you look at the orange bars, in the earlier periods, a lot of the productivity with growth was occurring because more productive firms were entering and less productive firms were exiting. But in the most recent period, that had disappeared. And so it suggests that this kind of state-led growth strategy or lack of real competition, open competition, is hurting China's ability to maintain productivity growth. And China's level of productivity is below global averages based on their 
level of development. And there's other research. We're doing a study with China on high quality development in China. And there's now a lot of studies looking at resource allocation in China showing huge inefficiencies in R&D investment, in infrastructure investment. That's not why China has done well in the past. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. And okay, next slide. Um, so in Asia, there was an interesting book that came out a couple of years ago. They came to ADB and presented this about Asian capitalism. And they argue that there's a lot of uh, socially connected and politically connected firms in Asian countries. So these are like these cool uh, network pictures for China and for India. In China, the red focus is the state-owned enterprises. In India, it's more complex, but you do see these clusters. Next slide. One thing that they also show is that the concentration ratios, which is an indicator of lack of competition, is still pretty high in many Asian economies. And I think, um, I think Philippines is in one of this. So Philippines is also on the high side. And they argue in the book um, that it's a lot of uh, family firm, very powerful, politically powerful family firms in many Asian countries that are very dominant. OK, next slide. We at ADB have a program trying to, actually, we've been working closely with uh, Secretary Balasakin, who used to head the Competition Commission in the Philippines, on developing a program where we're trying to support competition commissions to improve uh, competition policy and enforcement of antitrust or anti-competitive practices. And so you can see that many countries have founded competition commissions, but many relatively recently. So it's still a maturing type of an institution. But the other thing that has come out of the events that we've had, including with um, RC, is that competition policy really can't be just about these rules of antitrust enforcement. It has to be much broader to reflect the trade policy, industrial policy, regulatory policies, to think in a holistic way how to make competition more effective. And this is, I think, an important lesson, especially in the Philippines. Next slide. OK, I'm almost done. I'm going to take a couple minutes to wrap up. So uh, let me just say a word about industrial policy and trade policy. It is amazing. This is from a more recent working paper by Roderick and co-authors. The proliferation of industrial policy interventions we're seeing globally. Almost all of this is in the developed world. Again, we're not seeing it in East Asia and the Pacific so much, or any of the emerging markets. Um, and this is creating, obviously, a lot of challenges. Next slide. And the main concern I have is that, uh, well, two things. One is that when one country, advanced country, puts on an industrial policy, other countries feel they have to respond and have their own industrial policy. Uh, and the other thing people start to think is, though, well, if everyone's doing it, it must be, it must be something that really works, right? Um, and so that's very dangerous. Now, industrial policy is one of the most controversial areas of discussion among economists. And in Asia, many people, including many people who are very would have been very outspoken advocates of industrial policy. But, and Danny Roderick also supports industrial policy. Justin Lin, the former chief economist, from China, so strongly supports industrial policy. But Danny is very nuanced. He says, OK, it doesn't mean any industrial policy is good. And even Justin, when I talked to him about industrial policy in China, he says, well, you know, most industrial policies fail. But most countries will not succeed without successful industrial policy. Um, what I think is good in this review article by Danny, where he looks at evidence, is that Industrial policies work when they are complementary, again, this same like that innovation idea, to other um, important factors, including competition. Industrial policy that is broad-based and doesn't undermine competition is much more likely to be effective than the ones that just pick huge, pick winners, right, and give them billions of dollars. Um, that there has to be an export orientation and not be protected by tariffs that there needs to be a very close collaboration between regulators and business sector to really understand the constraints facing 
the targeted industrial sectors so that all the key constraints are being removed. Um, and that it could also require a public investment strategy or public service strategy that also tries to attack the, uh, the, the, the factors that are preventing industrial development in that sector in terms of business environment or infrastructure or other things. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so in trade policy, this is a slide I was referring to before. One thing that we are appreciative of, because by the way, ADB has always been a very strong proponent of regional economic integration and open trade and investment. So we see in the region that we have, we've developed something called the Regional Integration Index for Asia. And we measure it not just on trade and investment, but uh, different types of areas, including technology linkages, people linkages, money and finance, infrastructure, et cetera. And you can see broadly, it's at least stable, but some of these are increasing over time. The integration, especially the technological and digital connectivity in the region is going up very fast. GVC participation rates have been um, stable and in the very recent period have started to really swing up. So uh, this is positive and this is something, you know, linking it to my earlier comments that the global integration is really critical for productivity growth. And so it's good to continue resisting <laughs> pressures, I think, if we're in, in the Asia region against uh, protectionist instincts. And there, are, there is some protectionist instinct we're seeing, but it's not the right road. Okay, last slide, I think. Uh, I'm gonna skip this and just wrap up. So technology is really changing everything and will continue. I think at eight, one thing I'm realizing uh, since I've come to ADB is a lot of our job is just keeping up with technology, both in terms of how we do research, how we analyze data, but also analyzing the changes in technology and how it's affecting development. Um, and so this focus on choosing between manufacturing or services-led growth is really not the right question. It's really about thinking about an enabling environment for both sectors to flourish um, and support each other. Globalization remains critical and thinking about developing an innovation system, that's actually at a more advanced stage, not at the lower middle income stage. Um, and finally, industrial and trade policies have to be very carefully designed to avoid undermining competition or global economic integration. All right, that's it, thanks. That was just lovely, uh, Professor Park. Uh, you managed to articulate some very confused thoughts in my head into something very clear, coherent, convincing, and data-based. Now, I won't steal thunder from my very eminent uh, discussants, uh, whom I will ask forbearance if you may confine your uh, discussion to 10 minutes each. That'll be great. Of which the first uh, is Dr. Annette Balawing who is a professor, a professorial fellow of School of Economics, University of the Philippines, convener of the Escaping the Middle Income Trap Center for Inclusiveness and Competitiveness. She earned her doctorate in economics from Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and she has engaged in various uh, uh, projects related to Philippines, including consultant for the trade and investment chapter of the ongoing Philippine Development Plan. Annette, please. Oh. Just uh, one minute, uh, sort of like context. So when uh, when I came back to the Philippines, basically as work, that was in 2011 when we had uh, a project with the University of the Philippines and the Asian Institute of Technology with my university then where I was teaching, uh, Erasmus University, uh, Rotterdam, about escaping the middle income trap. So we got uh, funding from the Netherlands Scientific Council for that. And so our thesis then was there was a structural problem about escaping the middle income trap because the Philippines and many, that's why Thailand was also in our, in our 
research. Uh, and so we said maybe the problem there is the positioning of the Philippines and other countries in the global value chain, you know, stuck in low value added uh, task or uh, uh, production phases in that value chain. So in the beginning, we were really in interviewing export sectors, the PESA, and also looking really at exports. Until four or five years down the project, we realized that the problem of lack of diversification and all that was really stemming from the very dysfunctional local supply chains in the Philippines. And therefore, we shifted, you know, <laughs> really opposite 360 degrees to agriculture because we felt that, uh, you know, growth really has to be organic. As you said, there is no shortcut. You can't basically... Uh, uh, you have manufacturing and diversification in manufacturing without drawing in on the strength of your agricultural sector. So uh, we did um, uh, we did uh, a project with the farmer entrepreneurship program of Jollibee. So from very empirical work, we did you know field work and action research work with farmers in Dalaget, in Webaisia, and the tribes in Talandig. So you know, so it was really a very different, uh, was really a uh, dramatic change of focus. But what we realized is basically the problem of the farmers in that supply chain local is mirroring the problem of the Philippines in the global value chain. So um, as we gained insights of how, because we chose uh, the farmer entrepreneurship program because you we were looking at uh, how do they escape basically? How do the farmers, uh, how do you make the chain inclusive? How can you bring farmers out of poverty? And basically it's a journey of making farmers invest on their own on their own uh, future, on their own uh, production, and not just being dependent on subsidies, so all that. And, um, and, and that's why it's, uh, it's basically the, the, the whole insight there is what we, we just heard this morning, that really growth has to be uh, organic and we had to really tap on agriculture. And also, you know, that bundle, that necessary and sufficient condition for you to actually uh, do that. Um, you know, about industrial policy, because now, uh, before industrial policy was a bad word, right? You, you know, you don't even talk about it because it's activist, it's interventionist, it's government and all. And that's why when you say uh, uh, we have a pragmatic industrial policy, meaning we are not interventionist, but, but it's, it's basically one, you can be cynical about it. Well, you're pragmatic because you have no choice. I mean, you don't have any other option anyway. So that was most, this was, um, you know, if you look at industrial policy in the Philippines, it was very laissez fair in terms of really a cold shower and uh, basic cold shower approach. And uh, my first job when first from, fresh from, uh, from undergrad was to work in the AFTA uh, study commission. So we were having a lot of industry uh, industry dialogue and basically uh, the the message of government and academe to the private sector was you know uh, face out and invest and you know your shed your fat and and compete 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 and uh, the message that you were getting from the private sector instead was said no 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 because there's no level playing field so basically for us when we hear level playing field that's a bad word because hey you, it's, it's just an excuse until more and more we realize that maybe there is something to the idea that um, uh, it's like uh, it's like you compete, but then uh, there's another hurdle, right? I mean, it's not you, your electricity costs are higher, your freight costs are higher even now. So I was really surprised that nothing much has changed. For instance, uh, we um, we're trying to look at this possibility of bring of uh, bringing down the cost of fertilizer for farmers. And we have basically a, a, a new route that we can tap from Brunei. And then uh, the partners were saying, is this true? You know, if we ship from India to Manila, it costs 3,800. But if we ship from Mindanao to Manila, it's 5,700. 
uh, in terms of uh, shipment cost in dollars. So first, your electricity cost is already 40% higher than Thailand. Your inputs, because uh, if, especially if it's agricultural inputs and minerals and all that, it's all coming. Our, our archipelago, we, we are very sensitive to this cost. It's already so much higher. And part of that is again uh, regulation, you know. So why is shipping still, still so uh, cartelized and and all that? Why can't we bring down our shipping costs? Is cabotage still in the picture? I don't know. Um, and then of course we have the skills trap, meaning, uh, like what you said, it's uh, you you know you don't have there's no demand for higher level skill because there's supply, but there's no supply because there's no demand. So um, so we just keep on going in circles. And also the thing is the, 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 the leakage of investment in skills is very big because the wage differentials are very high. So, um, so a lot of our problems now, it's like when you're cleaning the room, a very, very messy room, it gets even more messy because before it gets better, right? So we are in a, in maybe in a phase of a, a messy growth where we have all of these chicken and egg uh, uh, problems. Um, but um, I just had, uh, uh, okay. Five minutes more. Wow, dami pa pala. Okay. <laughs> Patapos na ako. Tadagdagan ko pa. <laughs> um, so, uh, last week, we had uh, conversations with um, with local industrialists. And this time, uh, with Filipino-Chinese uh, firms, no? which uh, for, for us was, was really very uh, refreshing because, you know, you don't usually get to talk with them. And these are uh, firms that have been long in the in the Philippines, so 60 years, 50 years, and all that. And they have, so that's why we were going to them and asking them what, given all of these difficulties, how could how were they able to survive? And um, and so I realized that maybe we have been overly concentrating on the sectors that are export oriented when we have such a huge pool of local industries just uh, servicing a local market, which is big, which 120 million, with uh, an increasing purchasing power because of remittances. So that's really a power. And I think in terms of an organic growth, you know, um, if you, how do you diversify? You diversify first from strengthening your local industries, and then they, after that, they uh, they explore export markets and all that, right? So if we want to, to, um, if you want to go up the value chain, you have maybe to look at new entrants rather than incumbents or exporters that force them to expand. Because many times when we look at, when we talk to exporters and we say, well, if you tweak it like this, you can already, if just a little bit in the packaging and you can, and they don't want that because they're already in a niche that they're comfortable with. So the incumbents are very happy where they are. It's really in the new entrance that, uh, that there is a chance for. The, the, the sad thing there is that uh, we were looking at firm level data is that we looked at firm demographics. So given this firm level data uh, matched with trade transaction data that we, uh, uh, that we did with PSA, um, so we did the firm demographics, the, the entry, the death, the survival, the re-entry, and all that. And we saw that the real, um, where you have uh, a big uh, impact on growth are in the new entrants, actually. Meaning they're not the new that have exited and came back, but they're the new that, that they're really new. Because many of, the, many of the dynamics in the data are actually old firms that died, that exited, and then somehow resurrected. No? So, but the ones that are really, really new are the ones that are giving dynamism in, in the export market. And we found out that after 2002, the rate of new entrants have gone dramatically down, and the exit of what we call survivor firms have increased. No? And before, the trend was the uh, firms in the manufacturing sector have greater resilience compared to the average. But then uh, lately in the last part of the, of the data set, 
it has uh, uh, shifted. The ones in the manufacturing actually are the ones that are exiting more and uh, where the entry is becoming more, more difficult. No. So, um, and, and that's why uh, maybe uh, JC said that he will touch on that framework of the deviant behavior of a Philippine manufacturing. And the answer of Noel there was that, you know, if it's deviant, then let's go back to how it should be. And I think uh, one area that is very promising is really to concentrate on also capacitating our, our local industry. And I think in, if you look at industrial policy of, uh, let's say, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, I think that's where we didn't do it the same way they did. It was export-oriented, yes, but it was very, very much focused on enabling local industry. So yes, uh, an industrial policy that is broad-based, meaning neutral across the, but you need also to really have a, a much, uh, in a way, call it activist uh, stance to support local industries as well who are really trying to survive in the in the local mar in the local market um so i mean it's it's a lot to say in a few minutes and i'm okay thank you that's it thank you thank you uh, professor annette uh, from for that very uh, enterprise level perspective now let's hear the perspective from robbie Dr. Roberto Martin N. Galang is Dean of the John Gokong Wei School of Management in Ateneo de Manila University. Previously, he was Senior Private Sector Specialist for World Bank Group. He is well-published, Journal of Management Studies, World Business, etc. He got his PhD in Management from the University of Navarre and uh, Master of Science in Development Economics from Oxford University and AB Communication from Ateneo de Manila. Robbie, please. Thank you very much, Roel. So uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, no? uh, especially as it talked a lot about, uh, you know, it's within the slides. No? You could really see the, the move of the Philippines around manufacturing in our participation in GVC. Uh, but like what Annette mentioned, no, it's not a very positive story. In fact, when I was at the World Bank previously, we did a study on the GVC experience in the Philippines. And that chart really resonates where in 2015, we had, no, sorry, 20. In 2015, there's less GVC participation than it was before, right? And we saw that this was primarily a China effect, where what happened is that the, the GVC participation, especially of our MNCs operating in PESA, no, uh, is they used to be across a wide sphere of different levels of services. But because China entered and they have you know, lower costs, primarily due to better logistics, better infrastructure, et cetera, right? You know the story. Um, it really created a crater in the middle. So it pushed out many of the entities in the Philippines that were manufacturing mid-level mid technology goods. So it pushed out these firms. So the ones that were, were able to survive at those that were more resource extracting, you know, the ones that maybe were processing more agricultural products that were using minerals in the Philippines, that were using really local resources, so more low-tech. And those that were saved are those that were more sophisticated, right? That the Chinese could not yet copy. But again, that study was done maybe five or six years ago. And with the increasing sophistication of China, uh, maybe the GVC slide also needs to be reestablished. No? Because I think what ails manufacturing, we know the drill, right? Um, where um, a lot of the services that's embedded in manufacturing uh, that we could make money out of, design, testing, etc., you actually need the factory to be here. I mean, it's hard to offshore design or testing if you're not near the people who are working in the factory. So to create this uh, issue, right, to create this new service-driven uh, manufacturing, you actually need the factories here. But our other services prevent that. And you mentioned this, so see energy, logistics, customs, traffic, right? I mean, all of these things compound on the cost of goods, no? So as you mentioned, no, it's more expensive to ship from Mindanao to Manila than it is from. I mean, this is a long running story, right? So unfortunately, uh, our ability to create more services for manufacturing doesn't exist because our manufacturing is hampered by other services that we provide locally that are not competitive. So again, transport, telecom, uh, engineering, architecture, et cetera, right? So I think we really need to solve the services problem, especially energy. Uh, so that we can actually create a manufacturing base by which the services of the future will come from. So if it's hard to manufacture stuff here, then what can we do? So at least we have part of the story, right? Which services, 
right? We are a very services-oriented nation, uh, the BPOs. Uh, I won't discuss that in detail, but we all know that, you know, we're like the largest contact center industry in the world, $36 billion in revenue last year. Um, but with AI, unfortunately, I think there's a little shakiness in the sector. So speaking with the BPO firms, I don't think the fear especially is the replacement of, uh, of contact center people with bots. Right? Because if you've worked with ChatGPT, it's great. It gives you a lot of information, but it also gives you a lot of wrong information. So I think that uh, what people are seeing in the near future, it'll probably be a mix of both. You know, the human in the loop, where the AI can help provide scripts, can provide training, can make your voice less Filipino sounding, destroy your accent, make your ability. So that will improve. But the problem is that that actually makes our competitors equally as competitive as we are. Because what people like, especially Americans, no, they like hearing Filipino English accents because they're intelligible. So what happens now when you can use AI to get a Vietnamese or a Peruvian speaker to speak English in the same level as the Filipino? So suddenly, our AI, um, sorry, AI may not destroy the BPO sector in that sense, but can actually make our competitors a lot more sophisticated and they can actually catch up to us. I think that's a bigger fear, right? But again, there's still good news anyway. Don't worry, there, I do have some good news. Um, tourism sector is, of course, another growth industry. Uh, even though our tourism numbers are not that high compared to other countries, our domestic tourism industry is actually the biggest in ASEAN, right? You all like traveling. Maybe you have plans already for Christmas, for uh, the holidays. I mean, Filipinos have to travel. Uh, and especially if you can provide access better, like places like Panglao, uh, with the airport in Panglao, it's actually become the third or the fourth largest airport in the country. No, sorry, after Manila, Cebu, and then Clark. I think by the end of this year, it'll be the, the third, right? So it's very big. Uh, so I think that will then really help us expand our tourism base. Retail was mentioned, no? Uh, we're still very unsophisticated in our retail, but you're seeing all sorts of new forms of new retail coming in, not just Shopee and Lazada, which maybe some of you are doing now and shopping there. Uh, but you also have new formats, not like Dali uh, or Alpha Mart, which are sprouting like mushrooms all over the country. No? And of course, telecom. And the last one is, of course, is tech and startups. No? Uh, while we don't have the same um, head start as Vietnam and Indonesia, where you have already large companies, you know, like, uh, what's the Indonesian company? No? Uh, Gojek, et cetera, no? uh, Traveloka. Um, I think we are getting there. So the government did pass a number of laws recently uh, like the Innovation Startup Act, uh, which creates all sorts of incentives. Uh, it created, uh, you know, more improvements in, you know, in this industry. So I think we've been recently getting at least a billion dollars in funds raised, no? And because of how backwards many of our uh, physical industries are, I think the entry of tech and startup, especially as you mentioned, no, that startups create more economic growth than... Uh, than existing firms. So this could be a tremendous growth area, right? Especially now, even the LGUs are getting in the game. So for example, uh, this was started off by Makati that was given 1 million peso risk-free grants to startups hosted here in this wonderful city. QC said, wait, we're bigger than Makati. Why is our startup uh, grant smaller? So they have a 2 million peso uh, investment for startups that locate in Quezon City, right? Which is, of course, the better place to locate, no? Diba, no? <laughs> diba, no? Diba? Um, so, I think, so I think that's really a great area of growth. And hopefully, uh, that will really enhance the economic performance of the Philippines, given how our manufacturing base is, uh, is hampered. And I think where I want to spend the last five minutes of my uh, talk no, is the fact that at the end of the day, the issue is still and will be services, uh, especially the services that promote growth, logistics, communication, transport, energy, education, accounting, engineering, etc. Right? And I think the issue why this is expensive, which was highlighted in your uh, program, right, which is competition. Um, competition, these services have always have been very, very protected. Uh, in fact, the, one of the last slides that you showed, no, the STRI, in 2008 and 2012, the Philippines was the grand champion of STRI. What is STRI? STRI is services trade restrictions. No? Uh, I think only Ethiopia and Indonesia could beat us. No? So at least we have the bronze medal in trade restrictiveness. Go Philippines. No? Um, but that has changed. So in fact, if you look at the latest numbers, although I don't think the OECD calculated us, uh, the STRI numbers of the Philippines have dropped tremendously. Why? 
because over the past few years, we've, we've created mo many reforms like the Public Services uh, Act, which liberalized shipping as well as telecom to foreign investors, right? You created the Anti-Red Tape Authority. Yeah, I don't think we're there. No, I looked at the... Yeah. No, we're not there because this is OECD plus... So that's the other thing. No, it's sad that we're not there. Anyway, um, but we use, in some of the older versions, we were number one. But if you look at the more recent versions, we've actually, in some, in some areas like telecom, we're actually better than Singapore, right? Because we passed the laws that allow any foreigner to invest in our telecom space. Go Philippines, no? But the problem is, is has your telecom system improved recently? Uh, I mean, apart from Starlink, do you have any new players coming in? No. Because the issue is that, despite the, that the fact that we've created the Anti-Red Tape Authority, the Competition Commission, all these new reforms, many of the laws that we pass are never completed. So, for example, the Public Services Act allowed for the entry of foreign ships to go in the Philippines. That doesn't just require Congress to pass that act. It also requires the Maritime Industry Authority to come up with new rules, right? And Marina to this day has not come up with the IRRs to allow for domestic shipping to come in. And if you look at telecom, right? A telecom, yes, you can now come in, woohoo! But you need spectrum. You need, uh, you know, some permits from the National Telecom Corporation, which you know it's very hard to deal with many of the sector regulators. Right? So even if you liberalize one space, if you don't complete all the IRRs, if you don't also liberalize at the level of the regulator, then no one comes in. Right? So I think this is where we need to talk about. No? So I think uh, you mentioned about how government, especially in places like Japan, no, government and industry working together, that's the secret for success. In this space, the government, when they work with the private sector, corrupt. Right? Uh, instead of co cooperation between the government and the private sector to find new markets, what happens many times is that the regulator becomes so friendly with the regulatee that it prevents any other new entrant to come in. So I think that is key, right? That we can't just do the big bang reforms. We have to go down to the nitty gritty to fix all those bottlenecks. For example, one last thing, though. Uh, in the Innovative Startup Act, so that's great, no? There's actually a clause there that says a foreigner can now apply for a startup visa so that, you know, we can have Americans, Europeans, Koreans come here, they have their startups, right? But again, Bureau of Immigration has not issued a single visa. Why? There's no rules. So we have to complete all these rules to get anything going. And I think this is uh, where I think the Philippines really has a big weakness. Uh, because we don't complete our homework. Uh, we want, we create reforms, but it's m very piecemeal. Obviously, m much of that is deliberate because of the controlling interest, no? But in essence, for us to really grow, uh, there is a strong need to promote private sector development, but there's also a need for the academic, uh, ADB, and other people like yourself to help lobby and keep the reforms going. Because sayang yung momentum, no? It's a shame that we've created the difficult ones we just need to complete it and make it easy for firms to actually come. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Ravi, for that uh, quite uh, industry-specific, in sector-by-sector discussion. So our third discussant is Dr. JC Punungbayan, who is assistant professor at the UP School of Economics, from which he earned his PhD in 2021. I actually don't need to introduce him much because he's one of the most uh, more famous public well-known economist, uh, thanks in other, for other, uh, among other things, to a weekly economics column for Rappler, uh, a book published uh, last 2023. And uh, for all of his other details, let's just say he is a very worthy awardee of the 10 Outstanding Young Men Award for Economics in 2024. JC, please. Thank you so much, Roel, and thank you to uh, PEDS for uh, inviting me this afternoon. Um, this semester at the UP School of Economics, I teach martial law economics, the Philippine economy in the 1970s and the 1980s. And right now, actually, we're discussing the evolution of the Philippine economy in the past decades. And one of the most salient points uh, for this discussion this afternoon is that at some point in the 1980s, um, there was actually an, a surge of manufacturing. And you can see that that manifests in the 
GDP data. So in the early 1980s, uh, the share of industry in GDP actually peaked at around 40%, and then it kind of plat uh, went down since then, and then it kind of plateaued. Okay, um, so. Uh, of course, uh, there was a very heavy industrial policy during the Mar Marcos dictatorship. Uh, lots of state funds and all of the uh, external debt that we accumulated back then went to many, uh, uh, mostly to the public sector in support uh, of many of these uh, industrial projects. But the problem is, of course, for a long time, we maintained uh, import substitution in the Philippines. But I think the most important thing that stymied the uh, Philippine industrialization project would be the weak state and the corruption that went into industrial policy. So I think it's very important that at the same time that we're talking about uh, the need for all of these policies, we have to take it country by country and look at the uh, or a rule of law of each country, because I think that has a huge role to play when we talk about industrial policy. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Park mentioned that manufacturing services are becoming more integrated over time. Uh, but at the same time, when I look at the Philippine situation vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN, I, and when you look at the share of manufacturing and industry in GDP, uh, it was quite a surprise actually for me to realize that the Philippines is second to the last in terms of share of manufacturing to GDP. And also, we're being left behind by Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Laos in terms of the share of industry to GDP. So I'm just curious, why is it that even the countries that are poorer than us are able to actually boost their manufacturing and industry in, the, in just the uh, past couple of years? Uh, in other words, what are they doing that we are not doing here in the Philippines? And uh, if they can do it, why can't we? Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that came as a surprise, a bit of a surprise for me. I didn't know it was, uh, I mean, we were lagging behind in many respects. Uh, and then, of course, Vietnam overtook us in terms of GDP per capita during the pandemic. But yeah, I think uh, we're lagging behind in this sense as well. So this and many other things have led many economists uh, in the past decade to in the Philippines to think that maybe uh, the ship has sailed in terms of um, boosting industrialization in the Philippines. Uh, Professor Noel de Jos and uh, Jeff Williamson uh, of uh, Wisconsin uh, wrote this article back in 2014. And then they came up with a very um, stark conclusion. It seems likely that the Philippines has forever lost its chance at industrialization. And uh, there are many things that they cited uh, uh, behind this, uh, I mean, as reasons for this pattern, for example, the crisis since the 1980s uh, and the fall of the Marcos regime and subsequent political uncertainties uh, that led to us missing the boat in terms of many waves of uh, foreign direct investments. And then you have uh, trade liberalization, liberalization policies that exposed local companies uh, to international competition without uh, industrial support. Uh, the rise of labor migration, which may, uh, resulted in a steep appreciation of, pe of the peso, that has made um, Philippine manufacturing and, and exports a lot less competitive over the past decades. And then the surge of remittances coming from OFWs that has also encouraged a shift uh, from manufacturing to services. So for many reasons, in other words, um, and the brain drain, of course. Uh, so yeah, there are so many reasons to believe that why in the Philippines in particular, maybe uh, the industrialization project, um, uh, I mean, the ship has sailed in terms of that. Um, and then I would also want to point out certain constraints. If we want to boost, um, uh, so if you're led to the conclusion that we need services instead, uh, there are many problems as well if you want to boost serve or, or support service-driven growth in, the, in countries like the Philippines. Uh, for example, I want to highlight the uh, severe education crisis in the <laughs> Philippines. Um, I specialized actually in education, uh, but actually structural transformation was an abiding interest uh, years back. But uh, I'm led to the conclusion that we need to really focus on understanding issues in education. Because right now, the Philippines has a 90% learning poverty rate. Nine out of 10 kids in grade 5 in the Philippines cannot understand what they're reading. Okay, And obviously, that's a very, very huge problem that will really impede any kind of growth that we want to envision in the coming decades. And I think that's salient here in this discussion because, um, as Dr. Park mentioned, 
um, there's a greater integration of services uh, in manufacturing and vice versa. And we need innovation in these sectors, but how can we innovate if there's a 90% learning poverty rate in the Philippines? And how can we absorb people, for example, coming from manufacturing and industry into services, if they don't have the skills or the knowledge or the know-how because the root problem is the 90% learning poverty rate? Um, another important thing uh, that uh, Dr. Park mentioned is the fact that many foreign direct investments are going into services. Um, and uh, this uh, connects with issues regarding uh, the environment in the Philippines, whether or not it supports foreign direct investments. For example, again, going back to the weak rule of law, I think the Marcos administration, of course, is pushing for economic charter change, thinking that if they only open up certain sectors in the Philippines and change the constitution, then um, they think that that will automatically lead to more foreign direct investments, which is not automatic. Okay, So I totally agree with what Dr. Park said, that we need uh, to, to have the enabling environment for both manufacturing industry and services to grow. Um, but that's a huge question mark for countries like the Philippines. Now, if you think that service-driven growth is the way forward, uh, Danny Roderick actually wrote a few weeks ago, or I, th I think a few months ago, a paper. Uh, um, I mean, he what he says in the paper is that... Uh, uh, the future of developing countries lies in services. So as Dr. Farrakh mentioned, uh, Danny Roderick is, has become one of the more most vocal people uh, arguing for this. So he uh, laid out some recommendations on how countries around the world might uh, boost their services so that they can experience higher growth. And he mentioned things, for example, like uh, collaboration with large and productive firms to expand employment directly or involve MSMEs through supply chains or providing more public inputs such as loans and management training for uh, small enterprises or providing digital tools or technologies complement low-skill labor, enabling workers to perform more complex tasks. Uh, for example, if you allow or if you teach, for example, small vendors uh, on how to use e-commerce and uh, similar technologies, then that make, might make them more productive. So in that sense, I think at UP we're doing our part because um, if you know the uh, famous Isawan of <laughs> UP, uh, that means chicken is intestine. Uh, UP is famous for street food such as that. So when you go to UP and buy your ESAO, you can already pay using GCash and other platforms. So, so uh, that's uh, one of the uh, innovations that I think uh, Danny Roderick was alluding to. But that also leads me to think, uh, ito na ba yun? Is, is this the kind of uh, thing that, is this the most we can do to support the uh, productivity of uh, uh, people in services? Or what else needs to be done? What are the policies uh, that we can put in place to further boost the productivity of people in services? Uh, and I think that's a huge agenda for researchers and policymakers in the coming years. Thank you so much. Thanks, JC. There's a bright side to the learning poverty. The Philippines has invested in the world's largest daycare center. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we have, fortunately, 30 minutes for uh, Q&A. So kindly come forward to the microphone to make yourself heard. Please state your name, your affiliation, your question, and um, to whom you have directed your question. Very succinctly, please. Okay, uh, at the back, please. Good afternoon. I'm Ever from the World Bank, helping the bar program. And I think one of the, any, anybody can answer the, the question. I think one, Okay, again, I'm Ever from the World Bank helping the warm government. I think one context that is quite missing in the whole discussion is really the context of the fragile economies uh, because the constraints are really compounded. If you talk about the fragile economies, now, particularly for the Philippines, we, I'm referring to the warm government. So my question is, uh, in 2021, the warm region registered the largest poverty reduction. And one of the biggest contributor to that was really the growth of the services, followed by the industry. No? So the BARM government is a very young bureaucracy 
and uh, this is they are still in the early stages of uh, of institution building. So anybody can answer from the group. What are the key legislations? As I mentioned, they are still at the early stage of institution building. The the priority codes were just legislated. They have their own parliamentary form of government, and there's a new there's election for it coming in 2025. No, so it's a, it's it's still a fragile. Despite of the gains, it's still a fragile region. No? Now going back to this, uh, what do you think are are the key legislations to be enacted to ensure that there will be a sustained growth? No, because there was a. There was a severe poverty reduction in 2021, but those who went out from the poverty are still considered as near poor. They are still not, they, are, they, they still do not belong in the middle class. So what are to, to and we, we firmly believe that the services and industry can really the one that will really sustain them. It's really the stru structural transformation because 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, BARM was purely, agri largely agricultural, and now it's now services, uh, services agri-led uh, economy. So any suggestions or recommendations, particularly at the policy level? Thank you. Thanks, thanks ever. Any from the panel? Yes, please, Annette. Okay. You know, it's, it's quite complicated, no? Because uh, BARM really, uh, went out of uh, five decades of uh, of uh, of inner strife and that's really very difficult there are a lot of uh, trust you know we, you, because market uh, will only flourish if there is trust and the and the the result unfortunately of sp specifically civil war is that uh, the trust has been destroyed because it's different if you're two countries in the war after the war you can you can reconstruct the country and basically the the trust, the social trust within the country is still intact. But in the case of a civil thing, for instance, now with the MILF, they have to basically uh, deal with the local government unit that you, that before they were they were fighting. Uh, you, you know, they they really have an an armed conflict. So it's um, uh, the situation there is really complicated by. Uh, trust, which means that investors are still not coming in. Um, there is, you know, marginally in terms of tourism, but in but really investors that produce jobs, speci specifically in agriculture. You mentioned services and manufacturing. Well, the data say services, yes, but really very low added, really very low uh, value type of services, and manufacturing also really very small. So the number of uh, really industries that bring about jobs is still very, very small. It's still largely agriculture, so you can only talk about structural, because just structural transformation means that, you know, your productivity in agriculture is increasing so that you can release labor in agriculture and all that stuff, right? But if agriculture, if the level of productivity is very low, you cannot really talk about a structural transformation just because you have more people in low value services. So the problem with uh, the BARM is still really in trying to get the agriculture and fisheries, especially with the Basulta areas, going. And uh, a lot of that is, is really a problem of, uh, you know, just really post harvest. The, 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 positive thing about BARM is that if you look at the, you know, the typical growth picture, that the initial, there's so much pent up demand after five years of strife. There's so much pent up energy for growth that just a really initial intervention will really ex create an explosion of growth. You know, just a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, farm to market roads, just really a bit more agri uh, agri extension uh, of uh, services that will give you know the the it's it's exponential you know so you really you're really in the initial phase wherein you will get a lot of growth even in the most basic intervention um, in terms of legislation I think um, it a lot of it is an internal work within the barn because the tax revenue code is still not there. We still don't have, uh, you know, name it. We don't have a security and exchange commission in the bar. We don't have all the basic things that are we take for granted here are still not in place in the bar. 
So, um, and again, institutional building is still, uh, is, it, that's why maybe in the data, the, the biggest uh, contributor to growth is basically government because that's the largest sector in the BARM right now. Um, uh, as uh, also for, for jobs uh, as an employer. Uh, so um, the, the list of things to do within the BARM is still a lot. So just the basic thing, again, not, not be distracted with the hype things about digitization or there <laughs> because the, and I think where the BARM is very crucial is really in the, especially in the in the field of climate because that's really where our the last remaining uh, rainforest coverage is uh, still remains and the problem is that with peace during the war at least there was there were no illegal logging where the camps were and that's how basically uh, we protected many of our rainforests. Basically, the collateral benefit of war there was that we had, we have more protection for our rainforests. But now with uh, peace, now that roads are coming in, and then also illegal logging has uh, has increased. And therefore, it's very crucial, really, to um, to provide more jobs and more. And this is where the national government can really help. Because what I notice is that with the BARM a lot of the uh, national agency basically have washed their hands and say, okay, this is not our problem anymore. You have your own BARM, you have your own roadmap. So when I actually look, if you look at some of the uh, you know, strategies, and uh, BARM is no longer there because they say, well, BARM should have their own. And that's not true. It's, they're still in the Philippines. And if we're, they're the ones that really need that intervention uh, more than any other region. So um, again, a lot of listing. But I think legislation-wise, uh, the basics are there. You have the Islamic Financing Act already, uh, you know, the uh, the Banking Act, which is also very important because access to credit is very important in the BARM and it has to be Sharia because you cannot just say, uh, you know, 40% uh, of the unbanked municipalities are in the BARM. So, uh, uh, so that has been taken care of, uh, the basic, but a lot of internal uh, house, how, you know, internal work within the BARM still has to be done. Thanks, Annette. But uh, May 12, 2025. That's my own piece about it. If you have uh, credible elections, and uh, depending on the composition of the elected officials, you might see investment accelerate, hopefully, in the region. Next question, please. Yes, please. I was research scientist at the Asian Institute of Technology and university fellow at University of New South Wales. There's, there's this hypothesis on well-being and benign existence being only function of defensible wealth distribution and reasonable income redistribution and therefore we need only historic legislation into um, equitable and sustainable access to finite resources um, comment please comments please redistribution dr fred about redistribution policy Defensible wealth distribution, reasonable income redistribution. All right. This distribution, redistribution. Okay, thanks. Care to comment? Um, I support <laughs> uh, income and wealth redistribution, but you know these are uh, political and social choices. I think there is a now evidence base in research that uh, high levels of inequality are not good for uh, growth, but also obviously inequality is not good. It, it introduces lots of uh, challenges and problems for social development, political development, 
et cetera. And um, unfortunately, we live in a world where it seems to be getting, in many countries, uh, much more unequal over time. Um, so, uh, and, and there's also a literature on kind of relative deprivation where when people feel much worse off than the average people in their society, it really directly affects their uh, mental health, their happiness, their anxiety, you know, and then their physical health. So all of these things, I think um, we have data that, that is supportive of that. Thanks. This historic illustration of Panacea. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we have uh, previously some programs such as the land reform program that have attempted, uh, attempted some kind of redistribution. However, we still have uh, one of the highest Gini inequality ratios in the region. So there might be limits to what can be accomplished, especially in a democratic system. That's just my two cents worth, sitting as moderator here. Uh, yes, uh, well, let's give uh, the next question. Rivandra Royono, um, ID Insight. So, Robbie, I'm from the gold medalist of service trade restriction. Go Indonesia. Yeah. Um, so, th this is how I see, and, and JC, I haven't read Roderick's uh, article. I really should, which is surprising because, like, I think in the past, he seems to be convinced that it's not possible for a developing economy to bypass manufacturing, right? So it's really interesting. I don't know how he shift his, his mindset, but there are some anecdotal evidence that what happens in Indonesia is that people are transitioning from low productivity agriculture to low productivity service sector. And that's not really the kind of like, you know, uh, transformation that, that, that we want to have, right? So this is the way I see it. Let's, let's, let's break down the labor force into like three large buckets. The first one are everybody in this room, really, like the elites who somehow managed to survive Philippines and Indonesia's education sectors. And for us, like, you know, high productivity service sector is probably the future. And a lot of the things that we talked about would benefit us, right? There's the cohort that is about to go into the education systems, and unless we fix the education systems, they will get screwed. So like for them, really the solution is to strengthen and make sure that, edu edu that they go to school and actually learn something from those schools. And then we have the tens of millions of people who have been screwed by the education systems, and I really doubt that high productivity service is their future. So, if the manufacturing train has, like if we miss the manufacturing train already, right, and, and high productivity service sector is not the future for these tens of millions of people, then what is their future and what kind of policy that, that we can introduce to help them, right? Is it the case that somehow, and maybe digital economy turned low productivity service as like a pseudo manufacturing sector where you would have, you know, like millions of jobs in the service sector, low productivity, but at least it's higher than the agriculture productivity. Is that the future or are we completely screwed, Mike? <laughs> After, no, but you go first. Yeah, I'm just going to say that, uh, yeah, it's a big concern. And I think for most Filipinos, they realize that the solution is really just to work abroad. <laughs> so, for example, for many ner Filipino nurses, plumbers, uh, welders, etc. So even if, uh, if they do their work here in the Philippines, they will earn, uh, I mean, a puny amount compared to what they would earn uh, abroad. For example, if you're a plumber in Canada or in the U.S., you actually uh, might earn a lot more than a UP professor. <laughs> yeah, I th I'm, sh I'm sure of that. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, uh, it's, yeah it's, I think that has become the strategy for most Filipinos. But uh, that in itself has uh, its own problems, the brain drain thing. I think there's a recent paper showing that arguing that uh, in the case of nurses, 
uh, even if many F Filipino nurses have gone abroad, uh, that has actually led to more investments in human capital here. But my problem with that argument is that actually most of the people investing in the nursing education are also bound for work abroad. Uh, so that's the exact reason why we still have a nursing shortage here in the Philippines, despite larger investments in human capital. So yeah, I, I just wanted to point that out, that uh, overseas migration and work has become the solution to that, uh, given the immensity of the problem here. So I want to um, agree with the comment uh, and make a pitch that, uh, number one, it's hard to skip industrialization to reach high levels of development, um, with especially with inclusive growth, because only manufacturing can really absorb unskilled labor in a way that will raise productivity and employ enough of them uh, to really make a dent um, in uh, productivity and growth. So I'm skeptical of the view that you can just skip industrialization. But I also uh, want to, and so my second point is I disagree that the ship has sailed on industrialization in the Philippines. I think that's too simplistic because, you know, in the world of global value chains, uh, you know, you can find any niche along the value chain, you know, and, you know, the whole idea of comparative advantage is that everyone has a niche someplace. And I think the success of countries like Laos and Cambodia, which was referred to, is really because in, in more complex value chains, they can, they can just be good at a very simple activity and be part of global value chains. Uh, and that's what's happening. It's very labor intensive textiles and furniture and other things like that that they're, they're, they're starting to make some traction with, and hopefully that will lead to experience that will, and technology transfer and skills that will lead to expansion. Um, but there are no shortcuts. Uh, so like, uh, I think the learning issue is a serious one and a potential constraint. I think um, like electricity prices, regulatory issues, they've all been mentioned here. These are not intrinsic uh, problems that can't be addressed. Uh, I mean, these are all things that can be addressed. I mean, it may be politically <laughs> hard to address them, but there's nothing, fat there's no fatalism about this. And so I really, um, I think um, when I go to many countries, you know, I think oftentimes people who are in the country and are experts are too pessimistic sometimes. And people outside uh, tend to be too optimistic. So, uh, uh, but I think we should be more ambitious, right, about what we may be able to do and more demanding of our uh, 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 political leaders. Um, you know, you point out a lot of the issues about regulatory issues. And, and so um, I was thinking about, you know, I've spent a lot of my career studying China and the politics is so different, right? Because in China, for whatever reason, the local government leaders were really incentivized to achieve high rates of economic growth. I mean, there's no other place anywhere where that, I think, has been the case. Because most places, local government leaders are rent seekers. And so they're captive. And I think that maybe happens in democratic systems as well, where it's just a rent seeking game that it's very hard, you know, as was mentioned earlier. So I don't know what the solution to, to that is, but I think um, uh, it, may be, it may require some, some uh, political solution. Or the other thing I was thinking as you were talking about that is, you know, it's gonna take very strong leadership at the top. And one thing that governments can do to try to get past the rent seekers is to try to, commit the country to like international trade agreements that require them to do things or um, other types of um, engagements with, let's say, you know, even the Asian Development Bank, you know, we have policy-based loans where we can tie financial support to a certain policy reforms. And that has to be a strategy of leveraging the system, but that requ requires, you know, a, a level of commitment. And it's happening to some extent. I think the current economic leadership in the Philippines are is, you know, they're very experienced and pragmatic uh, leaders, but they still can't by themselves overcome the politics. Uh, 
just the, um, definitely we shouldn't give up on manufacturing because it's the really repository for the unskilled workers and the only option is to export people instead of goods. No? So definitely we shouldn't give up on it. I think there are two things. One is that the importance of middle firms because they connect the SMEs with the bigger firms and they're also the ones that source locally. And that's where the more... Uh, more horizontal industrial policy really ben, uh, will help because they're not in processing zones where you have all these uh, benefits of being in an export processing zone. They're the ones who had to deal with corruption, with electricity, with bad infrastructure. So definitely they're the ones who are going to benefit the middle firms and they're also the missing middle, right? There, there's also a trap there because the middle, you're not, uh, you're no longer so small that you get all of these uh, government subsidies, but you're still not that big that you get also the champion mark and then your help. The middle really are the ones who fall in between the the, the cracks. They go to trade fairs on their own pocket. They don't uh, benefit from, you know, from roadshows by government, but they are very, very important. So I think as uh, the government can really focus so much more with middle firms and profile them when they talk about policies, about interventions, they should think in their minds the profile of what is a middle firm instead of what is a champion of what is a micro firm, but really talk about the, the realities of middle firm. Do you know that in the Philippines, we don't have an export credit uh, system? Meaning if you have an invoice, all you need to do is, you know, is to bridge 30 days that you, you, you're not yet paid. And in other countries in the region, you just have like uh, invoice financing and then you get credit easily. In the Philippines, our uh, our our uh, exporters have to show all sorts of collateral just to get credit and bridge this uh, this gap. So that's one. Another thing, that, so there's still, if we have a premature industrialization, maybe we really have to go back and make it more mature. And there is really so much more space in doing that uh, as the local industry. Anything that has air or uh, bulky, can be made here because it's very difficult to import. Everything that's difficult to import, you can make it here and therefore you have a market and that's the room of expansion for manufacturing that we can exploit. Another thing is that with our work with agriculture, we see, we see a slow trend that where agriculture productivity is going up, young people are coming back or uh, workers that, for instance, go to the cities to work as security guard, as construction worker, go back to their farms because then agriculture is providing a better income compared to low services or manufacturing in the cities. And that's also a good trend because as I've said, there is still, so um, we still have a lot of room to uh, accommodate uh, unskilled workers in agriculture and in manufacturing. So I think it's true that we shouldn't really be uh, overly pessimistic about that, about low productivity in agriculture, because where there is productivity, uh, people are reacting to that incentive, meaning they're going back to agriculture. And that uh, in, uh, in uh, the manufacturing, the market is still big for local, uh, for local industries. We have time for one last question. Yes, please. Um, hi, good afternoon. I'm Ellie Encarnacion from the Department of Science and Technology, uh, specifically the Industrial Technology Development Institute. So as our name suggests, industrial, um, our tagline is actually to be the industry's leading partner in research and development, technical services, and transfer. Now, my question is, um, most of the technologies that are being um, developed are not being uh, widely adopted by our um, industry despite um, stakeholder engagements and also intense promotion. Um, what can we do to better convince the industry to invest in local research? Thank you. Any takers? Rabi. So, I like the UST because I think you're the one of the few government agencies that can actually give direct grants to companies, right? DTI does not do that. Uh, PESA doesn't do that. You're the only guys that give grants. Um, I haven't looked in detail at your startup, what's the name of the setup program, right? Where you actually give grants. 
Um, but I think that system is a lot better than I, is anyone from DTI here? Uh, than the shared services model that DTI has. Because the problem in the Philippines is that organizing as cooperatives, getting getting Filipinos to work together is the most difficult thing in the world. Because if you have two Filipinos working together, they have three ideas on where to go next. Right? So I think but what so that's why working through co-ops, working through trade associations, working through farmers groups, eh, um, <laughs> So you are on the right path, right? The setup grants that you've created are really good because there is a need. I am the company. I need help because I need to buy a machine that I cannot afford by myself. Uh, and that is the way to go. Uh, I, hopefully, we can do some impact assessment if you want so that we can undersee which setup grantees actually make it big and which ones don't, no? Because I think at the end of the day, that's where we need to be because that's where there is a specific need that you fulfill. Because from what I know, a lot of the DOSD grants uh, come from above it. Like for example, at Teneo, we do, uh, you know, when you have a grant request, no, of course we sometimes, you know, put our name in the hat, right? But it's based on an idea that you already have, right? So of course we will reposition our faculty and our research arms to, to follow what the DOSD says. So it may not necessarily be what we as a university need or what the computer science or the chemistry faculty want to do, but we follow uh, where the money is, right? So I don't know if there's a way to create the setup program or something similar so that it's more based on the company need uh, as opposed to based on an agenda set by, you know, uh, a person. Uh, if, because even if you have the problem with stakeholder consultation, especially in the Philippines, no, uh, I used to work for the World Bank. Um, Filipinos never say no. Filipinos also don't like offending. So if we're in a group and someone says, you know, the big problem is cold storage facilities, um, I'm not going to say, no, that's a stupid idea. No, I'm going to say, ah, yeah. <laughs> so eventually we'll all get a consensus that may not be the way. And this is, so especially when you work for the world, I, I always tell our expats who come here is that when you talk to an agency, they will always say yes. You'll say, you know, uh, come here, let's do a land reform program. Oh, yes, we'll do that. We'll do that, sir. <laughs> but whether they actually do it is different because we're just too shy to say no, especially if it's a stranger or a visitor. So that's why getting, um, you know, getting ideas based on consultations, especially if it's multi-stakeholder consultations, it sometimes ends you in the wrong path. Uh, so my suggestion is that, you know, if we could repurpose, because I, I really believe the setup program is a very good program it's probably the if i were to go into a you know a manufacturing sprint i think that's the way to go uh that plus maybe get some funding from ndc for bigger you know corporations because in essence that's how china did it right so if you're an investor they say i want to build a factory to make screwdrivers they say oh, here's the plot of land you know here's the incentives you know here's some tax free here's some grant money and i think to fight against these kinds of firms, even in Thailand and Malaysia, we need to have the same types of incentives built in, right? So if the OSD can really pivot the setup grants towards, you know, a whole suite with, of course, the safeguards so that the money actually goes into the proper investments, I think that could really, you know, uh, move the needle in terms of manufacturing. Because you will get people who have actual ideas that just have a financing gap. Um, again, this is a problem of the missing middle because there's a lot of patent coming from uh, universities, but the incentives stop there. So once the IP has been filed, then there's no more incentive from the university side to further uh, commercialize it. And then from the from the industry side, they're not also going to invest on the commercialization of an IP because it has externality. So once they do it, then it can be copied and then no one has the insight. So basically, that's a missing middle. No one is investing on the on the translation of the of the industry of the intellectual property to a commercialized thing and where you have a market failure like that then you only have two options either it's a collective action problem right so it's either government comes in which is the OSD and there's also now the pristine project when it's an ADB uh, funded with DTI and uh, UP of how to to address the missing thing or again this this kind of collaboratively because no you cannot say to individual uh, firms, you cannot convince individual firms, you can only 
convince collectives of firms to invest on that space that has a lot of externalities. All right, so it's great to note on the end of uh, on the topic of innovation because that's one of my take homes for today. Uh, maybe discussion about services or industry is a bit too abstract. Uh, we can talk of both as long as both are centered on innovation, which in turn is driven by competition rather than you know some fancy policies we might have the core of it is competition i think so with that i guess we can express our appreciation to our valued uh, speaker and uh, discussants ah okay so this is this has to be scripted properly <laughs> all right um maybe uh, um can i have the uh, all of them nala is it the same language uh, for each, okay. So for each, <laughs> here are the uh, certificates of appreciation, and we'll just hand them one by one. But all of them have the same wording: uh, imparting valuable insights and inspirations during the tenth annual public policy conference given this nineteenth day of September, twenty twenty-four. Makati City, Philippines, Certificate of Appreciation, signed Dr. Aniceto C. Orbeta to Dr. Albert Park. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, this is for Dr. Annette Balawing Talkmans. Please, Dr. Annette. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Roberto Martin N. Galang, please. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, oh, Dr. John Carlo. Now I know what JC is. Dr. John Carlo B. Punong Bayan. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so um, the, the plenary starts at 4, so you have time for snacks which are served outside, but please reconvene at the uh, main uh, Isabella Ballroom at 4 o'clock sharp. Maraming salamat po.